Hello and welcome to our webinar today <clears throat> on data-centric transformation. My name is Kevin Doubleday. I'm the Director of Communications here at Flurry, and I'm joined today by Dave McComb and Brian Platt, here to introduce the concepts of data centricity. We'll cover what data centricity means, why it matters, and some technologies available today to help you transform your organization to achieve data centricity. We'll get started in just a few moments, but as folks are still joining, I'll take the opportunity here to introduce our two thought leaders speaking today. First on our agenda, we'll have Dave McComb, president and founder of Semantic Arts. Dave co-founded Semantic Arts in 2000, and during that time, he focused most of his work exclusively on helping clients adopt semantic and graph database technology. About five years ago, Semantic Arts pivoted into more hands-on work, assisting clients with the actual work of adopting these techniques and engineering their data-centric transformation. Dave has written two thought-provoking books on his experiences, Software Wasteland and Data-Centric Revolution. In the last five years, Semantic Arts has executed over 50 projects, all which focus on data-centric transformation in diverse industries with clients including Morgan Stanley, Standard & Poor's, Bryce Waterhouse, Schneider Electric, MD Anderson Cancer Center, and Electronic Arts. After Dave, we'll hear from Brian Platt, the co-founder and co-CEO of Flurry, a data management platform built for data-centric enterprises. With over 40 years of collective experience building successful IT companies, Brian and his co-founder Flip Filipowski have applied their knowledge in the enterprise technology space to forge a new path forward in data management, focusing Flurry on providing the platform for data-centric applications. Lastly, a few housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded, so you'll be able to rewatch it or distribute it to your colleagues. And throughout this event, please feel free to use that Q&A tool down in the lower right. Uh, I will jump back on and moderate those questions after the presentation. Uh, because we do have two speakers, try to specify who your question is intended for, or you can leave it open-ended, that's just fine as well. So with all of that out of the way, uh, without further ado, I'll hand the mic over to Dave to kick things off. Take it away, Dave. Great, thank you. Let me just... So as, uh, as Kevin mentioned, we've been working with a lot of, of very large enterprises for the last 20 years. And recently I asked a graphic designer to put together an artistic impression of what the typical enterprise architecture looks like. So I think many of you are from large firms are gonna recognize parts of this. Um, down there in the lower center, I think you can you just make out the SAP infrastructure and the multiple redundant implementations of it. Up in the right, we've got, uh, we've got a data warehouse and the newly emerging Snowflake and uh, over there on the left, we've got Informatica and the ETL pipeline that's holding this whole thing together. There's a nice Hadoop Mongo cluster in the middle. So I think, you know, I think this will be familiar to many people. What I want to talk about today is that that artist's or impression is, is pretty accurate. Enterprise software is pretty much a mess right now. The integration of it is even worse than the, than the individual applications themselves. What's weird and what keeps it in place is that everyone accepts this as normal and as it should be. I just, I just read a book recently uh, from the guy who's head of uh, Procter & Gamble's Data Transformation. It's a very good book, but at one point he starts talking about healthcare.gov and how it was an inherently complex project that got screwed up. Um, it actually wasn't an inherently complex project. We're going to talk a little bit about it and some other things like that. I think what has, has happened collectively to the industry is like that parable of the boiling frog that we've, we've been sitting in this stew and it's been gradually getting hotter and we don't notice that, that there's something kind of drastically wrong here. So I was sitting in my office one day literally the week that healthcare.gov rolled out. And one of our developers, and I hadn't heard about it, because we were working on something else at the time. And, and uh, one of our developers comes in and says, man, I just heard about this system that has 500 million lines of code. What could possibly, what problem could possibly be that hard? I said, I don't know, what is it? He says, healthcare.gov. We type it in 
And we were one of the lucky few that first week. We actually got all the way in. It was slow and cumbersome and ridiculous. And he had a pad of paper. We're going screen by screen saying, okay, what would it take to do this? What would it take to do this? We get to the end and we said, that's it. Um, we say, wait, what do you think? Five or 10,000 lines of code? I mean, that, that is not 500 million lines of code. And by a weird coincidence, the next week, I met the CEO of a company called Top Coder. And Top Coder is this, is this company that will put together sort of a mini X prize. If you have a really gnarly problem to solve, you can put out a $50,000 prize and they'll get two or three teams to compete and you only have to pay the winner. And I said, man, you're not gonna believe it, but healthcare.gov is kind of a, a uh, Top Coder size project. And we were just starting to look for a sponsor to, to pay it. You know, I said, this is all it is really. When I stumbled across this, this site called healthsherpa.com, where they had built the exact, they built health, healthcare.gov. In fact, it was much better. It was faster. User experience was better. Healthcare.gov eventually cribbed uh, the, the user interface, and they call it healthcare.gov light. How demeaning. But anyway, um, so I've interviewed the CEO of Health Sherpa several times, uh, and, you know, as, as suspected, it took two or three of them a couple of months to build the equivalent of what had started life as a $93 million project. And eventually, by the time it got stabilized, was a $2 billion project. Uh, this little team, in fact, it was a much smaller team at the time they built it. That's it. They can't spend $2 billion. So um, I also came across an interesting, uh, in Australia, the Victoria province sheriff's department wanted to take the cameras that were on the, the dashboards of their, of their cars and automatically look at license plates and detect stolen vehicles or, or uh, expired plates. And they put out a bid and somebody won the bid, the software project for $28 million. It turns out a blogger named Tate Brown thought, I wonder how much of this you could do with open source software. And he ultimately, you can go look him up, find his, his blog. He ended up writing the system in 58 lines of code. This is a lot of it right here. You know, he just puts the code around his website and he put that code into his system and put a camera on his dash and he could find stolen cars and all kinds of stuff. Um, the, Canadian Firearms Department went out to bid for a registry and the, the, the net price was going to be $2 million, which was a, hundred, a very precise $119 million to build the system and it would generate $117 million in revenue. $2 billion later, they shut it down after they'd registered, you know, something like 8 million guns or something like that. But, uh, you know, Slightly more than you could do in a spreadsheet, but you know, really, two billion dollars. And I'm, I'm, you know, telling stories just to see how bad it can be. But you know, this happens in commercial clients as well. Many of the ones that we work with, they're better at keeping it out of the news. Uh, what's probably more routine is people spending fifty million, a hundred million on projects that could be. 500,000 a million, actually once you have a very mature architecture it could be much, much less than that. If I had more time, I'd go into some comical systems that were launched just to, just to add one or two features and they end up becoming these giant self-eating watermelons. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how that happens and what to do instead, but I just wanna kind of raise the stakes for, for you know, just how significant this is. So we, our root cause analysis suggests of all the problems, everybody says it's methodology, it's project management. No, I think it's really unnecessary complexity and, and an application centric mindset. So the complexity that we, that we put up with is, is quite incredible. Here's a, we went into a client who had their own product catalog to manage on order of, of a, a million complex products. The, catalog system had 700 tables and about 7,700 or about 7,000 attributes for a total of 7,700 concepts that you'd have to master just to do anything with the product catalog. We 
uh, build a semantic model of this, loaded all the data for all million of their parts and all their characteristics and prices and offerings and all that stuff. And after the fact, we looked at them, we only had populated 46 classes and 36 properties. That's almost 100 to 1 or 100 fold reduction in complexity just in one system. And what we're finding is that these kinds of, of reductions in complexity uh, are, even, are even bigger when you go across systems because the same concepts tend to get implemented over and over again. Um, we worked with a company that sells data for a living. Down there at the bottom is kind of an artist's rendition of uh, an inventory they'd done of 160,000 data elements that they had available for sale in their various APIs. It was so complex, they were having trouble migrating clients from one API to another because you would need several experts in each of these things to just to negotiate a simple uh, trans translation. But really behind the scenes, there was this 150,000 attributes um, can be handled with, uh, with a, a small, you know, under 500, well under 500 concepts. So 300 fold reduction in complexity there. Um, we worked with a multi-level marketing firm and multi-level marketing firms have very simple products but incredibly complex um, uh, spiffs and what they call genealogy and who gets to share what percent of when you brought somebody in, your upstream, your downstream and all that kind of stuff. Um, what was sort of interesting, uh, this, this system had 2,500 tables, about 25,000 attributes. Um, again, we, we had done the design. We know there's, there's only about 300 concepts in, in total. It was sort of the amusing thing was there was 2,500 tables in the online system and they were only selling 2,500 SKUs. So, you know, with that other complex system, they're selling a million SKUs um, and needed 80 concepts to cover that. So, and then for a long time, we thought, well, maybe it's only big complex companies that, that have the luxury of making things overly complex. But one of the simplest systems we ever saw was the Washington State Secretary of State. You know, all it does is registers corporations and charities. That's it. The three existing systems collectively had 2,400 uh, columns of attributes of data in total. Um, by the time we were done, you know, just a 120 uh, even, even in these very small, very simple uh, systems, you, you know, it's not unusual to see a 20 to one reduction in complexity. So that's one side of the equation. The other side is this, this mindset uh, that's keeping things entrenched. We call the application centric approach. You know, everyone laments the existence of silos and yet they turn right around and create more silos because they have, they have no idea that they're doing it. And we, um, we put some hidden cameras and hidden microphones in boardrooms and conference rooms to see if we could figure out how this happens. And here's, I think, a pretty good s scenario of what happens. Somebody has a business problem. They go, oh my God, what are we gonna do about this? And they convene a committee, they brainstorm and talk about it and most of the time, it ends up being an information systems problem. So they convene a subcommittee to figure out how we're gonna solve this problem. And at this moment, the, the trap is, sprung, is set, but it's not yet sprung. And they're about to make what they think is an important decision, but it turns out to not be a decision at all. The decision they're gonna make is whether they should build a new system should they buy it, you know, an application package, or nowadays they have the option, should we rent a solution? Should we get software as a service? And, and, it, and it feels like this is a, a real decision, but it, in, in the overall architecture of things, this isn't a decision at all. It all ends up in exactly the same place. Every new system has a completely arbitrarily different representation of the data that it's gonna manage most of which is already overlapped with all the other systems you have. So you've now either built, bought, or rented this new data model, and you've created yet another silo. And so if you ever wonder where they come from, that's, that's exactly where they come from. And nowadays, 
any VP with a credit card can create a new silo, you know, it's offers a service, here you go. So the alternative to that, we call it the data centric approach. Um, it's, it's not all or nothing. Um, you know, people become data centric kind of gradually. We think it's also a prerequisite for a lot of the other things that people want to do, like digital transformation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. But let's kind of focus on what we mean here. We mean that there is some application functionality, but what functionality there is, is loosely bound. And, and I don't have all my slides in here for this presentation, but I think those of you who've worked in systems know that traditional applications are very tightly bound to their rigid and complex schema. So here we're talking about loose binding to a single, simple, extensible, federatable shared model. Um, there's a lot to unpack in this. We'll go through a little bit of that, but, but um, there were some earlier technology. People have, have achieved this with uh, older technology, relational and the like, but it's a very hard thing to do. I've interviewed a couple of firms who, who have done it. It's really the hard way. We're gonna to talk today about what is the relatively easier way of doing this. Um, we found there's kind of three legs to this stool, if you will. There's three parts that really help make it. And like I said, none of them are essential, but all three of them make the whole thing a lot easier. Um, first up, Knowledge Graph or Graph Databases um, is buying you a lot of flexibility. Um, it, it gives, and, and we'll see in a minute how moving from table-oriented schema first to graph-oriented schema as you go um, is, is a much more flexible paradigm. You get integration almost for free. Instead of spending most of your budget on integration, we're, we're snapping things together based on shared identifiers and not doing joins and a whole bunch of ETLs and all that kind of stuff. And this is what is gonna, in the long term, get rid of your data silos. So graph database, fundamentally is based around, instead of the idea of a table on the right here with secret agents, we turn that information into graphs. Each individual edge node edge is, is a tiny digraph that, that contains the same information. The little colon to the left of 007 and last name uh, is a hint that it's actually more than just a local identifier, but space doesn't allow on PowerPoint to show what's really going on here. Um, but what it means is every time you get another piece of information and regardless of where you find it, it could be in the same table, a different table, another database, an unstructured document. If we can find out that 007 was assigned the, that special Rolex watch, uh, we just add that on them. It, it, it doesn't have to be true of all secret agents that they have assignments and watches and all that kind of stuff. And if we later find that the, the watch has a garret, you know, the, piano wire to take somebody's head off, uh, you know, you just snap that on and the, and the graph grows like that. Um, that's the, the whole nature of graph databases. The second leg that we think is important is, is using semantic technology and using it well. Um, semantics is the study of meaning. There's a W3C standard called OWL to give you a formal way that both humans and computers can share a meaning. And it sort of forces you to be much more precise and interestingly, a side effect of that is that it makes things simpler. It, it, it's, not, it's not obvious just in saying that, but, but it's what we have found. If you start with a, a small, well-vetted upper ontology, and we have one on our website, it's available for free, it's called GIST, we've used it in dozens of projects. It seems to be a pretty good starting point for enterprise ontologies and then you build out something domain specific from that, it, it sort of helps you keep it simple and, and it sort of helps with the future integration of it or you know, reducing complexity and making it easier to integrate other ontologies or other data sources. Um, we advocate rooting your, um, your model in the real world as much as possible. If, if, these, these existing applications that are overly complex, if you use them as the basis for your model, you will have an overly complex semantic model. And there are lots of them out there. That's not a productive route to go down. Uh, also, the other thing we wanna be able to do is keep something simple enough and rooted in the real world 
so that the practitioners and the business analysts and everyone else can both vet the model and use it. The simpler it is, um, the more likely that is. And the last thing, um, semantics gives you a, a property called inference. They're, they have these programs that run that allow you to create new information from existing information. You know, we were just doing an example recently. You may know that somebody lives in Los Angeles. Are they bound by the CCPA, which is California's equivalent to the GDPR? Um, the system can, can infer that they are because it knows that Los Angeles is in California and that it applies to residents of California and that living there is residing and email is outbound marketing, et cetera. And then finally, the third uh, leg of the stool is the idea of, of, of model-driven everything. So the model-driven movement makes the observation that most business functionality really is pretty simple. There's a lot of it is just forms and tables and, and some pretty simple validation, things like that. If we could quit hand coding 90% of that, and, and just focus on the, the handful of algorithms or, or uh, complex little bits, um, we can make our system simpler. And when all you have to do to change the system is change the model. So, you know, imagine instead of hand coding 500 input screens, um, you have one screen that knows how to process forms and you just have a model behind it. So well, this form has these three fields and do this validation, all that kind of stuff. That's the general idea. Um, this movement was initially focused on user interfaces because that's where a lot of the effort goes, but we've now seen, and it especially works well with, with semantics and graph databases that you can manage things like constraint management, you know, what will we or will we not allow into our database? Uh, how are we going to manage security? How are we going to do systems integration, storage procedures, lots of other things, uh, in fact, I, I've got another slide somewhere. There's about eight or nine more things that if you really think about it, you can build the model, build the architecture and, and run the system. I mean, Gartner's been calling this the low code, no code movement. Um, a long time ago, we were calling it model driven. I still prefer that, that term. Um, there's companies like OutSystems and Mendix and the like who uh, have, have been very successful with this. They've got thousands of what they call citizen developers that build applications. Um, you know, we applaud them, but it's being built on relational technology and it's application centric thinking. And the more of that you do, the more, the more silos you're going to create. So, you know, we're advocating that the, the next generation of model driven is going to be based. It's going to be graph database native. It's going to use semantics. It's going to be data centric. Um, and we, we discovered several years ago that when you move from application-centric to data-centric, you have to replace some of what the application was doing for you in the architecture. If, if the application is no longer the center of the universe, then what is and how is this all going to hang together? So we've been running a, a forum um, next February, and it's on our website there if you want to check it out. Next February will be the third annual. It'll probably be mostly virtual. Um, in the first annual one, we, we, post, we got a bunch of thought leaders together and postulated that what an architecture would have to look like to, to handle this. Uh, last year, we invited uh, a bunch of practitioners in and, and, and vendors to show us what they had. And let me kind of go through. This was the, the original sketch of, we call it the grapefruit inside of an onion. So that yellow stuff in the middle is the grapefruit. And there's a, there's a whole story as to why it's the way it is and why the circles are epicentric and what they all mean. Um, it was, a, it's just a, a reference sketch. It's not even a reference architecture. It's just a sketch of what needs to be there. Um, here's what, you know, just a, a quick idea of what's going on in each of the layers. Um, but obviously if you're going to be a data centric there at the center is data and the various services you'd need to make data self-managed, uh, spiraling out from that. Um, and we were very happy in this la last February, just before the, we got shut in, uh, we had our conference and one of the attendees was Fleury, uh, who had built not only an architecture, but even a diagram that looks suspiciously like that. 
I call it life imitates art. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian now to, to, to describe what it is they've done. So I have to quit sharing, don't I? Let's see. Where is my quit? Oh, there it is. Right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dave. And let me make sure my slide deck is up properly here. And there, I hope everyone can see the slide deck. Maybe if someone shouts out, if, if for That's some reason they can't. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks. Um, I really appreciate that, Dave. And I've, I've, uh, really followed semantic arts and Dave in particular as it relates to um, these concepts around being data driven. I think it just unlocks such immense power in what we're trying to accomplish. Um, Dave spent a lot of time, uh, at least up front, talking about some of the costs, some of the implications, uh, sort of the, the huge hole we have digging, we have dug in developing applications the way we've been going about it, you know, his, his squiggly diagram. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on the cost, but I'm also gonna try and touch on some of the opportunity. And one of the main things I think I'll point out with the opportunity is that um, I think it's not that hard to probably get buy-in that the opportunities that successful companies will have over the coming years are those that can more strategically leverage data. And right now, I think you know, the, the reality is, is most organizations probably have a hard time uh, looking at how they're doing it today and thinking they would score a very high grade with it. Um, we have these digital native companies that have emerged in the last you know, 10 years, and they've had the foundation about thinking about data uh, at their core. Uh, while I'm sure they would all think they have room to grow as well, um, they've been able to do some pretty amazing things with that, whether that's Google or Amazon. You know, it's uh, hard to think of Amazon as a uh, e-tailer or anything else. It's at their core, they're really a data company. So they've really mastered this. Uh, however, most organizations have not. So we're not quite there. So how do we think about getting there and what are some of the implications? Uh, we, and, and I think Gartner's kind of acknowledged this, that traditionally businesses have always had these three categories of strategic differentiation. It's been people, process, and technology. And there's this argument that's this fourth one in there now, which is data. So uh, in order to be able to leverage this and remain competitive, we, you know, there, there's not only a cost opportunity to becoming less application-centric and more data-centric, there becomes sort of a survival opportunity that we believe is merging. And so, you know, Dave really covered this idea that we keep creating these additional silos. And instead of thinking about this, really thinking about data first and the application just becomes a layer around this really valuable reusable data asset. And importantly, which, you know, we didn't get into a lot, part of the foundation of these technologies is that these data systems can be combined together. Uh, we can actually get away from this idea that all data needs to like physically exist in the same space to be able to run a query or get issue, you know, any sort of resolution on it. Uh, obviously data warehouses and data lakes have emerged from that, but these, you know, W3C semantic standards enable this idea that we can actually leave data where it sits, where it probably has security wrapped around it. Uh, and avoid the expense of having to physically mangle all of this together to get value. So what we end up doing is we end up with an opportunity to create data ecosystems, connected data sets. And importantly, those connected data sets don't even all have to exist within your company. Uh, part of your data ecosystem could be public data sources. It could be, you know, partners and customer data sources that come in. So as we think about becoming more and more data centric, and we think about what's happening today, there's new questions that are coming up. Like who owns data and how is privacy being handled? How do we know that the data that we're working with has integrity? Like has that data been tampered with? Has anyone modified it? And who, how and when was that data originally put into our system? Again, if data is the foundation of our business and our strategy, these are kind of pretty fundamental questions we think we'll have to be able to answer. 
We, of course, have AI and machines now making decisions more autonomously for us. But how do we actually understand and trace back how they arrived at those decisions? Uh, I just uh, penned an article on Forbes about why AI needs blockchain. And of course, blockchain and cryptography are a part of what we do at Flurry, and we kind of combine this with semantic uh, graph technology. But part of the point of that article and the point of this is that as these machines are making these decisions, you know, we as humans can make a judgment call whether the information we get is truthful or factual, but how do machines do it? So there needs to be more of a mechanism for machines to validate their inputs as they're making these decisions. And especially when you think of where these decisions are being made as they're getting into, you know, healthcare or into other domains, the implications of decisions could, uh, you know, turn out to be life or death sort of decisions. And then importantly, and I think Dave really focused on this with this idea of reducing complexity uh, in how we're currently storing data. The question is, how can we better organize our data to maximize the value you were getting from it? And importantly, then, now that we have this great data asset that we're actually leveraging, how can we securely share it with those who can also leverage it, like our customers, like our partners? So, when we think about a traditional application today that needs to be shared, there is an immense cost at it. I'm going to come at this a slightly different angle with some numbers than Dave came at it with. And the idea is that a typical enterprise app today takes costs about $175,000. It's represented by this green bar. And there's some sources for kind of averages and stuff for costs down below uh, for anyone curious. When we make the decision that the data housed in this application needs to be leveraged by either customers, partners, or other applications, we end up having to get into this sort of new world. And the databases that we have not only don't address those new data questions that I just talked about, they don't address this ability at all natively. So now we've walked into the world that we have to build it. And to the right is a good example of the costs of making an application more data centric. Now, again, there's some applications that may not have this requirement to be data centric, but more and more of our applications do. And it is not, you know, um, unimaginable to think that the cost of this application can increase tenfold based on that requirement. So a lot of this is building APIs. You know, APIs not only have a cost on you uh, to build it, you also sign up that you have to maintain that API, but it really uh, subjects your customers or consumers of that API to immense costs because now they have to write custom code against your custom API. And now they have to sign up over time to maintain that as well. So it creates this ecosystem of costs that is immensely difficult to manage and becomes exponential. And one of the stats that we highlight here, which I think is demonstrating one of the key consequences of this beyond cost, is that of security. If we don't not only allocate the money to build the, and maintain these APIs over time, it means that we often unintentionally open up security vulnerabilities because we're not keeping our APIs up with our application or our data models and our security rules, or we're building security rules in you know, 50 different places and 50 different APIs, and maybe we miss one or two two of them. And because of this, I think the stat really collaborates that that is in fact happening. This is put out by Akamai recently, that now in financial services, 73% of all corporate hacking attempts are happening at the API layer. And of course, the hackers are going where the vulnerabilities are. They know the vulnerabilities are here in the APIs. So how do we think about addressing some of these new challenges uh, that we have around data that traditional databases were never designed to address and how we handle some of this sharing. So uh, this is the diagram that Dave referred to that's also uh, a concentric circles or an onion, if you will. And I'll walk through the different layers that we think need to be there to address these challenges. And at the foundation is trust. And trust to us means that we can prove Mathematically, any consumer of data can prove mathematically and simply that data has never been manipulated, that it has integrity, and even prove where that data originated. 
And right now we really have no good concepts of this. And in fact, I would argue a huge part of what we spend money to auditing firms is to help them come up with a third party validation that the data we're relying on has integrity. We have the ability to have systems demonstrate their integrity natively now. And we think trust should be at the foundation of any systems that we're developing. And the second, which we spent you know, most of this time talking about is this idea of semantics. We have these uh, uh, open technologies, these standards that now allow us to express data in a highly reusable way, connect data across sources. And you know, I, I, as Dave mentioned, get integration for free. Uh, which sounds like a pretty amazing thing considering, you know, some corporate IT budgets now reflect that 50% of their entire budget is just on system integrations. So you can imagine the type of cost savings that we could achieve if we can ultimately get there. And I fully understand we're nowhere close to there in most organizations today. So we'll also talk a little bit about how we take some of these first steps. Then we need to wrap this with security. So how do we protect the data? We often talk about data defending itself. And we think that the core security around data, especially if you get out of being application centric, we need to move the security for data into the data layer itself. This gives us immense flexibility, especially in any application that has, or any set of data that has multiple applications that need to access it. Because today we always do security at the edge. And if there's five applications at the edge accessing our data source, it means we're re-implementing security, hopefully the same way, five different times and trying to keep it up to date five different times. By moving data security into this tier, it now frees our applications from being able to manage that. It brings us more security. And in general, security uh, is moving more towards these infrastructure and away from edge security. Um, so this is right along with that trend as well. And it's not only, you know, who can update data and under what conditions, it's also what shape data needs to have so that we have data that has more integrity and that, it, you know, we hear bad data, um, that bad data in, bad data out. We want to make sure we are able to enforce so that we don't get bad data in. We think time, uh, and we're pretty unique in that we focus so much on time, but we think time is an integral part of this. And especially if you're talking about machines, talking to other machines. If we're talking about traditional data, traditional data and databases are constantly, the world is changing underneath their feet. Every time someone updates something, their, their view of the world changes. Well, if we now have to coordinate systems, uh, multiple systems together, how can we possibly reproduce results or get them to agree to a common view of the world if there's no such thing? So we think you should be able to always look at data as it relates to time and understand what data looked like at any point in history. So we focus on this and call this uh, time travel. But in you know, a flurry world, it's the idea that you can issue a query, whether it's a GraphQL or a Sparkle query to it, and you can optionally specify, I don't wanna know what you currently know, but I wanna know what you knew two seconds or two days or two years ago. And that should instantly be available. And it turns out this time dimension solves so many problems. It really uh, creates uh, and eliminates huge burdens in so, so these cloud native microservice architecture. That's one of the common issues people run into is that you have all these microservices, but they can't agree on a notion of time. So then they have conflicts or race conditions where they have different views of the world because they're milliseconds apart in processing things. Being able to lock in time it just ends up solving a ton of issues. And then lastly, which we talked about is that we think these data sources need to have a native ability to share data with consumers. And because the sharing can sit on top of time and can sit on top of security and can sit on top of semantics and can sit on top of trust, it means that we can now start um, opening up our data sources and exposing this valuable asset Right now we have a lot of, you know, tiny pipes into our data that we manually create called APIs. It really limits the ability for people to strategically leverage the data that we house. And if we can address the sharing at the core, we can open up these big pipes for different people to express the data that they want in the shape they want it. We can get out 
out of the business of building custom APIs, and we can sort of sit on all this foundational components. So this is kind of our view of the world and how we start to solve some of these problems and open up the opportunities that we, we talked about. And I'll conclude before our questions here with just talking about um, what are some simple ways to get started down this path? And, and I'll highlight kind of three ideas. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunity here, but just focusing on three ideas. One is that if you're building a new application today, that that data you think has value or needs to leverage valuable data from other applications, my first recommendation would be the best way to get out of the hole that we have dug in most enterprises is to first just put down the shovel and stop using it. So it's a real opportunity to look at these types of technologies. There might be a little bit of you know, new concepts that some people on your team need to learn. It's not overly complicated. It's entirely standards-based. There's a ton of assets out there. And it really, I think, helps uh, position your organization to take advantage of these concepts when you strategically need to in the future because your competitors are doing it. So anytime you're looking at a new application, I think one of the first things you should look at is, hey, is this an opportunity to use these new technologies? Because that's going to be the easiest way to gradually crawl out of the hole uh, into the future. Another very common initiative that a lot of large enterprises have is around master data management or master data services, as, as we would probably refer to it, because we think it can do a bit more than just manage the data. It can provide a lot of utility on top of it. Uh, these often have budget assigned to them and strategic initiatives already. It is an absolutely wonderful place to leverage this technology because by uh, it, focusing an effort like this around this set of standards is going to give you so much more leverage for the data and the work that you're doing in this initiative. Um, so that would be another key thing to look at. In this third area, I want to point out, because it's something that's emerging, but I think it's really going to change so much about how we think about data. And it is a World Wide Web Consortium standard called Verifiable Credentials. And one of it, it's all about portable data or data containers, if you will. We've gone through this whole containerization of our infrastructure, and this is almost a containerization of our data. It sits entirely on top of these semantic web standards. It's represented typically as JSON or JSON-LD, easy way for people to understand. But what it is, is it's an encapsulation of a set of data. That data can refer to these common schemas so that anyone that receives this capture of data effectively has a reference to the schema that tells us what that data means. So, you know, it's not like a relational database where we'd have to export all the data and export this big schema out. We can sort of refer to these global or common schemas. And one of the easiest ways um, to talk about the potential verifiable credentials that everyone can relate to is it as it relates to personal data and personal information. So Department of Education and universities are actively exploring this, and they're exploring this with the idea that they can issue not only a physical degree and transcript, but a digital one. And I started out talking about this new data challenge around privacy and data ownership, and this is a really good example to it, of it. By issuing a digital university degree to a person, they can now take this degree in this data container and they put it in a wallet on their iPhone, or they take it however they want. Now I own it, I control it, but it has all the cryptography and everything around it to prove that it was actually this university that issued it. And now as I have to do something like a background check as an employer, I no longer have to go to a third party provider who's gonna you know, call up and get a transcript. Now the employee can actually present their transcript along with the proofs around it that it can be independently verified. Uh, Department of Homeland Security is very focused on this around a uh, couple areas. One is just, you know, identifiers, things like passports or driver's license. We should have a digital form of that. Another key characteristic that this has is the ability for the consumer to selectively disclose which pieces of data that they want to out of their data container for different people. And we see the real sort of uh, foundational piece of this around organizing information sharing across organizations. And it's a very different sort of way of thinking about it. Today, say in a supply chain, people need to all be on the same EDI network to share data, for example, or they all need to be on some sort of common infrastructure. 
Well, if different people in the supply chain can now assert information about whatever product or information they're shipping, and if these data containers can not only be proved that they've never been tampered with, but who sent them, now we can actually pass these along. They don't, not everyone needs to be on a shared system and everyone can independently verify these. And again, because they sit on these semantic web standards, we can actually combine these data containers together into these common repositories that we can do analytics, we can drive workflows around, we can do a lot of neat things. So I think in the coming years, you are gonna see a ton of information coming out about verifiable credentials, their potential, and what they do, but this is another exciting emerging technology uh, that we're seeing come up that's sitting on top of these ideas. And with that, I'll conclude and I will uh, pass it back over to Kevin to help moderate some questions. Great, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Dave. Uh, we're now at the end of the presentation portion of this webinar, so thanks again uh, so much for giving us uh, your time to learn about these data-centric concepts. Uh, we can get to some questions now. I have quite a lot of questions, so if, if we don't get to yours, uh, I do apologize, but we will be in touch afterwards. Um, Dave, we can start with one for you. These were more comments than questions when you showed that artistic representation of the enterprise architecture at the beginning. We got quite a few comments. Uh, you know, someone said you captured it so well. Another attendee said, where are the hundreds of spreadsheets that people are passing around in email? So you may, you may have missed that one. No, I, yeah, I see it. And, and I hope I didn't give away any proprietary secrets with that diagram. <laughs> Tried to hear it as best we can. Yeah, this, the spreadsheets are all in there. It, it's it's mind boggling to us how much key information is, is currently in spreadsheets. And that's one of the simplest ones to pick up and put in a graph where you could actually manage it and have people sharing and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Uh, Isabella asked to Dave, uh, where does master data management live in your model or is it quote unquote dead? Yeah, well, it's, and it's interesting that Brian picked that up there at, at the end. Um, yeah, we see master data management moving to the graph. I mean, it's a, it's a great place just because of the flexibility. What, what, what happened, and I'll let Brian fill in on this a bit as well, but where master data management came from was people recognized, yeah, we've We've implemented vendors now in 30 different systems and, and they don't change that often, but when they do, we're not keeping them up to date. Let's just put it in one place. But historically, the one place they put it was a relational database that was too rigid to support many of the, of the conflicting needs of the 30 systems that were relying on it. So you just take that middleman and say, let's have a, let's have a graph, be a little bit more flexible. Um, turns out there's some really interesting stuff you can do. We're just talking to a client right now who wants to look at the fact that some of their clients are their suppliers and different divisions are, are working with the same entity in a different way. And if you, if you keep thinking master data management as vendors and clients, no, in a graph, any, any one organization can be one or the other or both. But Brian, why don't, why don't you expand? Cause you had a whole thing there on that. Yeah, and I, you know, we, we try to extend this concept because we think just getting master data together, of course, is a huge accomplishment, but it also, again, gets, doesn't fully help you realize sometimes getting the value out of this asset that you now have. So we like to say, think about it as a service. Uh, in this way, you can start now thinking about how you're going to apply security, how that data might be more easily shared directly with new applications. And then you need to think about these new small applications that you might be building can now, instead of creating another data silo, they can sit on top of your master data services infrastructure and maybe even have a tiny little place where they're storing their state or contributing back into that master data management. And eventually, you know, I think it's a nice way of, again, kind of digging out of this hole. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to leverage these technologies. Great, thanks. Um, Brian, this next question is for you, it comes from Gianna. You mentioned blockchain. Where do you envision data-centric design and semantic modeling being most powerful across the blockchain landscape? Yeah, so I think where semantics really come in is this idea that um, you don't have to have everything in one physical location. And I think that's the big mental barrier that um, 
people are not used to thinking about and is a hurdle. So even in the blockchain space, you know, you have these huge blockchains that sort of everyone has to use to be able to interoperate. These semantics actually give an opportunity for that interoperability, not only in the blockchain space, and, uh, you know, I'm sort of, uh, blockchain's a, a big and sort of involved space, but, um, you know, I'm thinking about it more as a place where data is housed, but the other main place where data is housed is in your traditional databases. So it has the opportunity to bridge these things, and, you know, one of the things that, you uh, blockchain technology certainly provides is it provides this idea of cryptographic proof and trust. Um, so that, again, is a foundational thing that we think we should be thinking about for all data as we move forward and we're trying to develop new advanced concepts like AI and machine learning on top of data systems. Right. The next question is from Danielle, and it's open to both presenters, so we can start with Dave. One of the pain points in the adoption of semantic web technologies seems to be the learning curve. Do you think that using only label property graph and graph databases, for example, Neo4j, instead of W3C semantic web and RDF limits the potential of being data centric? What should be the aspects to consider? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Neo4j and, and you know, Janus and Tiger are popular because they're pretty easy to get started with. For the most part, uh, and, and, but there's not really that big of a difference. One of our guys, Mark Wallace, has a presentation you can probably find on the web of, of just how to, get, how to get over the learning curve and, and get started with RDF a bit more simply. Um, but our message is more for our clients. This is, if you, if you want to design for the long haul, and this, I think it's going to take people a long time to get fully migrated to being data centric, then I think you want to be based on open standards and lots of vendors and, and, and the ability to, to swap things in and out. So while you can get some sh quick wins with something that's a bit more proprietary, I'm not sure that's, that's taking you the long, the long way. You may, you may learn something and that may be good learning, but you know, assume that you're going to move on later. What do you think, Brian? You have an opinion on that? Yeah. Well, the you know the only thing that I would add, and just for clarity, in case everyone in the audience doesn't know, there's kind of two flavors of graph databases. So there's one we call more the semantic graph databases, which have been the ones we've been focused on and that we have Flurry focus on, and then what's called a property graph uh, database, which would be the Neo4j's of the world. And they each have different advantages. There actually is an extension to semantic graph now called RDF star, which uh, incorporates property graph features into RDF. So you don't necessarily have to make that decision anymore. But uh, um, what you really lose between those two uh, concepts is a closed world versus an open world concept. And when we talk about getting data leverage, I think a lot of that leverage comes from the open world concept. So while I think there's you know great uh, technologies for different situations and they all have to be evaluated. I think in the long term, if you're trying to have your data as strategic as possible, you need to think more towards the semantic graph, the open world concepts. Brian, this question is for you from Sivarama. What kind of metadata features or functionality uh, do, does Flurry provide? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, a lot of people think of uh, semantic graph technologies as an excellent way of storing and managing and querying uh, metadata. So um, I would say that that's kind of fundamental um, to how data is organized. Um, one thing uh, that's maybe also worth highlighting, I talked about two versions of graph databases. I mean, we kind of have these categories of popular databases. We have document databases, which you can sort of represent data in a graph-like structure, but it's not graph at all. We have relational databases, which we've talked about, which is your data looks like rectangles. It's, you know, Excel spreadsheet-like. And then we have this other graph uh, capability. Um, so the problem in the, the plus and minus of a document style database, and this would be like a MongoDB, is that they were originally designed for hyperscale, immensely fast writes, and they're very, very good at that. But they're very, very poor at queries, 
and they tend to not have sort of acid compliance. So this idea that you have to write data in multiple different formats, know how you're going to query for it ahead of time. So it's a great way of storing a lot of data that you have limited sort of query patterns for, but you might have high write volumes for. Relational databases, I don't think I have to go into that too much, but um, you know, it has immense query capability. Uh, really the beauty of graph is I feel like graph can uh, have it has immense query capability and it can easily represent data as both a document style and a relational style so i feel like for the most part there are some trade-offs but for the most part you get the best of all these worlds in one solution so that would be one of the reasons i would think about that and certainly metadata management would be you know one of those core prime use cases of where you get a lot of value out of the graph side Okay, this one is for you, Dave. Jose asks, what kind of performance differences have you experienced in apps based on schema as you go, based on graph databases, versus the schema upfront relational silo-based apps? Yep, and this is gonna be my, my last, uh, I do have to hop off here, but um, yeah, performance, always an issue for very simple things, like if you just got an individual table Relational probably still has a slight edge. You know, everything can be indexed. You can get it rapidly. When you take a few joins, relational starts slowing down. You start doing, you know, five, six, eight, ten table joins, and pretty soon relational is is really wheezing. Um, the graph stuff, uh, for the most part, a lot of these complex multiple hop things are pretty performant, and where they aren't, you have a lot more tuning options you can you can just if, if you find yourself traversing the same eight links over and over again and that's a performance thing you can just insert another link skip over all that make speed it up you can the the one of the standards called r2rml which tells you how to map relational to to graph um was very cleverly designed so that you can create your map and you can run it as ETL if you want, or if you decide to leave the data where it was, you can run it as a federated query. And of course there's performance trade-offs to that, but the, the kind of cool thing is that as you're working with it and you see the performance, you can say, oh, I'm gonna co-locate some of this, that it will speed it up. And so a lot more options. Um, you know, we've, we've worked with some people that have hundreds of billions of triples in these triple stores. And so, you know, I think, and you can federate them. So, I mean, that's what you end up uh, always doing so there's a lot of headroom but you know performance is always an issue and with that i'm sorry i've got a i've got to sign off and we're at the perfect thank you dave uh and it does seem that we're over our scheduled time uh i do see quite a few more questions in the chat uh i do apologize if we didn't get to them but they're not lost uh we'll have them in our after webinar report ironically in a, an excel spreadsheet uh and so we will be able to uh, get some answers over to you. Uh, once again, thanks so much for spending an hour uh, of your day with us. Uh, make sure to check out both of our websites, both Command and Park and Flurry. And from the Flurry side, Flurry is a technology that is free to download. We don't even require an email. So just get it installed on your machine and you can get start, uh, you can start building. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Have a great rest of your day and take care.